Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today's guests are Imja Choi, founder and CEO of the Pan Asian Senior Service, and Ken Yang, managing director of the Pan Asian Senior Service, uh, or PASI. Uh, thank you for joining us, panel, and a reminder to our webinar guests that you can ask questions through the Q&A functions at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to cover these topics during the show. Thank you both for being here. This is such an important topic. You focus on Asian seniors and others disadvantaged by language and cultural barriers. Imja, talk about how you came to found the organization. What was the impetus for your creation of the uh, of these set of services? I found the organization in 2004 because of my mother who developed a cancer and had a cancer surgery and uh, stay in the hospital for many months. Finally, she was ready to discharge when she weighed 62 pounds. Can you imagine someone weighs 62 pounds and uh, they want me to send her to nursing home, but she didn't eat American food and she didn't speak English at all. How could I send her to nursing home? So I brought her home, then everything stopped in my life and I had to take care of her and I thought she's gonna uh, be better or uh, I can find the help, but none uh, was available because I, there was no help uh, who can send uh, me a uh, Korean speaking home had date or some, somebody who can cook Korean food. Uh, so um, I was looking for one, but it took me seven months to find one uh, because there was no agency in Philadelphia area. So finally, I was able to connect with her and hire her immediately uh, through Payada Nurse, uh, which is a large agency. So that's how I uh, find uh, my home had day. But um, after that, many of my friends, my mom's friends started to call me, where did you find her? Where can I find someone like her? And so I felt the actual need of this service, that there are no one in uh, providing that service. So uh, I thought I wanted to help some, my friend, Korean community friend. So that's why I thought under my previous nonprofit, I major organizational dynamics at University of Pennsylvania. And while I was at Penn, I create a nonprofit called Women's Development Institute International. So under WDI, I create the Korean Senior Service. So uh, that's how I started this uh, uh, to help my friend. And then pretty soon I learned there are none of these uh, other, other Asian community had this kind of service. So I add one language at a time. So 2005, I started to send out the service. It took me almost a year because I, I was not really familiar with the healthcare system, welfare system, all these things. So that's how I started. And my mother, believe it or not, uh, who thought no one lived uh, beyond the few weeks, uh, lived eight years under my uh, home care. So uh, I utilized uh, my experience uh, with the home care, whatever she needs and other Asian community people need. So that's how I developed uh, my organization for the need of these seniors who did not speak the language, who did not know the culture and, and was completely silenced, uh, you know, because of their situation. No, this, this is such an American story. You had a situation, a family situation, and out of that, you invented an organization a, that provided a solution for you, and then you began to share that solution with others. And you could take that same approach in the arts. You love music, so you create a way for people who love music to come together and present music. You have a disease, cancer or ALS or muscular dystrophy. So you create an organization to do research and to provide care, right? You have children that need to be taught. So you create a school, right? This is an American approach to, to solving problems. We come together 
taking our personal experience and then deploy it in service to the community. And Ken, you joined, when did you join uh, PASI uh, to, to help uh, Angel? Sure, yeah, and thanks again, Mark. Uh, I joined PASI a little bit more than two years ago now. Um, and I have some uh, previous experience kind of in the uh, Philadelphia nonprofit community-based sector. But uh, this was Penn Asian Senior Services, PASI in short, was my first experience, and thanks to MJ giving me the opportunity to serve our, particularly our older adults, our, our, our seniors in the community. And it, it's an experience that has been eye-opening for me. Uh, I am Korean American. I was born in the States, but to um, Korean immigrant parents. So it's been a very rewarding experience to be able to engage with my parents' generation and, and honestly, even beyond my parents' generation and uh, hopefully find a way to give back and, and to serve that community. So we've, we've all been watching as uh, xenophobia at, um, grips uh, the United States. And Ken, if somebody asks you where you're from, where are you from? Yeah, well, my proud answer is I'm, uh, I'm from the USA. Uh, I am a US citizen but I am also so proud of my Korean heritage. And uh, that also goes into why I'm very proud to, to work for, for PASI. Um, so uh, I, I do like to embrace both sides of my culture and I really don't view them as sides. They, they kind of engage into one whole. Well, just as I, just as I come from German ancestry, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one of these things where we need to really understand how Together, we can solve these problems. So, so you started off, uh, Imja, uh, finding solutions for a mother who, um, who spoke a particular language, who came from a particular uh, tradition, and then you expanded the linguistic range. And, and talk about how that uh, has evolved to today. How many languages, how many different traditions do you try to incorporate in your, in your group so that you can meet the diverse needs of the community? Uh, we serve in 17 different Asian languages and uh, five plus European languages. So all together, uh, we have more than 20 some languages that we serve our clients. And we are serving uh, more than 800 direct care uh, patients, uh, I mean, uh, clients that are uh, under our care. And uh, now we have almost 600 employees. Uh, so uh, I often go to different meetings and, and uh, in the uh, different setting. For actually, I became a CEO a few years ago. My board wanted me to uh, become a CEO because of my organization. Anyway, and people see me and then, oh, I saw you somewhere. I met you at the dry cleaning stores. <laughs> Something <laughs> like that, <laughs> you know? Because they, they have some notion of this Asian woman often, you know, nothing wrong with the dry cleaning store, you know, but still they have this notion. And um, uh, those kind of things. And uh, I did, put up with those kind of resistance uh, or from, from the certain people. But I believe in American system is fair. So uh, where there's a will, there's a way. So that's how I always believe in myself and trust the system. And I see you have, as a CEO, you have this very fancy office. So, so you're, you're coming to us from your very fancy office obviously, uh, yeah. <laughs> as we are all, all self-isolating? <laughs> yes, because of the COVID, uh, we are, uh, you know, stay at home governor's order. So uh, I stayed home and uh, recently we, I mean, most of our employees had uh, um, two day uh, telecommuting and two, three day on site. So uh, I was doing that, but I need the office uh, in order to do that in, in my home. And there's no other room in my home other than the bathroom that I can use as my office space. So um, I had uh, bought, I mean, bought this chair, this uh, 
uh, fancy chair. <laughs> so I can use the other side as my, uh, um, my bathroom uh, regular uh, uh, mirror and sink. And then if I turn this uh, the other way, and um, th with the same chair, I can use as my um, office desk. I mean, office desk and chair. So okay. it works great well for me. <laughs> so we, we just uh, issued a poll about, uh, um, uh, for those who attend to, to, uh, to vote on whether the U.S. prepared to, uh, to take care of uh, our 80 million in 2040 Americans uh, who will reach 80, uh, who, who will be 65 years or older. And 74%, basically three quarters of those responding uh, feel that the U.S. is not prepared. Only 5% feel that the U.S. is prepared. Uh, Ken, as, as you're looking down the line um, in, in the next 20 years, are, are, do you believe that these organizations uh, can scale up to meet the needs uh, that are going to hit us? And they're going to hit us in a huge wave. Sure, and it's a, it's an important consideration because uh, uh, we're based out of Philadelphia, and uh, Pennsylvania, the the state of Pennsylvania, uh, is home to uh, a large portion of that over sixty population, even even today in the states. So, uh, as a senior serving organization, and really uh, with home care, um, so uh, services that uh, assist our elders in remaining independent in their homes by providing services of daily living uh, through a one-on-one -on -one home health aid. Uh, in that line of, of nonprofit business, I, I feel like we do see hope for the future because as, as we all age, and especially as our kind of um, uh, culturally kind of unique elders and, and, and linguistically unique elders age, uh, the more kind of services and supports that enable our elders to remain at home in their chosen communities surrounded by their loved ones and live independently outside of the institutional setting we feel is a uh, is a, a really nice win-win for both our seniors who continue again to remain in the comforts of their home uh, surrounded by their loved ones as well as for uh, realistically for our government because uh, remaining at home is uh, again both good for uh, our elders uh, as well as good for for the system because it's a uh, it's it's a um, a more cost effective means for providing for uh, all of our elders and even as as we age ourselves. Another aspect that that is interesting and I wanted to ask you both about is uh, various Asian organizations how we are responding um, in in this time to um, to uh, whether you are affected whether your your clients are affected by these comments that we're hearing about um, that, that, that blame uh, people of Chinese origin uh, for the pandemic. Um, and there's so much fear surrounding the pandemic, right? That sort of uh, racial uh, uh, focus uh, as a way to create a focus of fear based in race. Are, are you finding that that is affecting your communities uh, uh, much in Pennsylvania and, and in, in how you interact? Is there fear building in the community? How, how is that affecting you, you all? Ken? Sure, well, um, what we are, are, are really pleased to report is that uh, Pan-Asian Senior Services, uh, although Asian is certainly in our name and, and our clientele is, is predominantly Asian American, we have, and, and really Imja has from 2004, from when we first started in a much smaller building that we're in now, have always been focused on engaging with our neighborhood. And uh, our neighborhood right now is the Oak Lane neighborhood of Philadelphia, uh, which features a predominantly, let's just say, a predominantly African, African American base of, of neighbors as well as Caucasian. And so what we have really seen, and, and we can only speak to our, our, our personal experience and our organizational experience, is that our neighborhood has embraced PASI as PASI has embraced our neighborhood. And one of the ways that we've particularly been able to do that, even in these difficult circumstances with the COVID-19 pandemic, is by starting a, a new program that speaks to the community's need, as well as our clients' need for, for meals. And, um, so we may go into that a little bit more, but 
we have been able to open our doors to an even larger base of potential clients, as well as just recipients of meals uh, from within our neighbors, whether they be Asian American, Caucasian, African American, regardless of ethnicity, anyone who can appreciate a Asian meal is welcome. And that's really the spirit of PASI. And we're really pleased to say that, that our community has reciprocated in spades. And we were just asked by uh, Joyce Bash um, about who pays for the uh, home care and the various services that you provide. Um, can, you, can you give us an insight into how that actually functions? Medicaid pay for it ultimately. Mm -hmm. But uh, now in Philadelphia, uh, since 2019, uh, January, three MCOs, managed care organizations, insurance companies are the actual one who is managing the home care and sending service orders. And um, so uh, we are directly paid by MCOs, but uh, Medicaid is the one who is ultimately paying the one. And do you help uh, people as they navigate the whole um, uh, Medicaid, the insurance uh, issues and so on? Because you become a vehicle for the efficient use or inefficient use, if you're, if you're not good at what you do, of, of of these of these funds, um, how do you help people to navigate that? Because because that whole payment complexity is 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 such a burden, particularly for older seniors who might not even have uh, children who are capable to to navigate or friends who are capable of navigating with you. What kind of services do you provide in that regard? Actually, uh, at the beginning of my uh, my uh, passion. Uh, I had the same experience with my mother. I didn't know where to start. And I had a master's degree from uh, the United States. I, I have no idea, you know. So I know average people have a lot of, lot of difficulty to navigating the system. However, uh, we do have uh, someone who is helping uh, to try to uh, serve those who wanted to find out, find a way so, uh, so they can call us and uh, we have a uh, separate service uh, such as peace program, different program. Uh, so not only we do the direct care, but we also do the social service who need that uh, service. Uh, we will assist them uh, in. So we uh, uh, serve those uh, hundreds and actually thousands uh, per year uh, through our social service uh, coming uh, for the service and some uh, telephone and uh, different way of we are helping them to navigate the system. So uh, they don't have uh, my difficulty, <laughs> take a year, to, but believe it or not, it still takes six months from the beginning to when you get the service order, actually we can send out the home health aid. It still takes six months. It's, it's amazing. And there's so many different competencies that evolved. You basically outlined that, um, that uh, you need to have all these different languages uh, within your, your expertise. You need to have physical and mental health um, experts and partners. You need to deal with the, the social uh, aspects of aging. Um, and, and you are ad administrators where you're dealing with insurance companies and uh, government uh, payroll uh, uh, payment uh, organizations. Ken, how do you put together the infrastructure that is lean and that relies on volunteers and is sustainable? Because in point of fact, most of your money, you want to go to direct service. You don't want to go to a right. huge infrastructure. How does that, how does that function? We have, uh, from the very beginning, very lean operation. Uh, so when uh, we have a uh, service order that we receive, uh, then, then we hire uh, home health aid. Uh, but because we are nonprofit, that's one, uh, one advantage that we have. We started from the very beginning as a nonprofit. So um, uh, we, we don't have to make a profit to, to remain open. 
So that's how we do it. Uh, Ken, you want to add something else? Okay. Sure, yeah, and, and, and that was really the lead point, and I guess why we're on this uh, nonprofit report, Mark. Um, it really all stems from the nonprofit vision that uh, PASI started with, which is serving uh, older adults who may have cultural and, and linguistic barriers to uh, access all of the benefits that they are entitled to and, and really need. And so that vision really strengthens and supports each decision that we make. And you really put your finger on it, Mark, that there are administrative aspects, there are human resource aspects, there are just things that we have compliance aspects um, uh, of a business. And it's, it's all part of what makes this job so rewarding as well, because we really are trying to run a business that does good for the community. And uh, we uh, really like the nonprofit model because as we do a good job with our business, uh, we do a good job for the community that we serve uh, because that's really what we're all about. No one owns PASI, the community owns PASI, and we're led by our board of directors who, who guide us uh, in trying to achieve that mission. And the profit accrues to the elder Americans who profit from your, your way of operating, right? You're, you're not extracting from them or from their right. families. You are Absolutely. Yeah, uh, one thing I wanted to add, uh, uniqueness of our organization is we have a community coordinator system. So each community, a bigger community, uh, Asian uh, community, including Indian, Vietnamese, Cambodian, Chinese, uh, Korean, and uh, Chinese, so forth. So have expert, so forth, uh, for their community. So anything uh, about, uh, let's say, Vietnamese community, we have a Vietnamese uh, coordinator, community coordinator, who supposedly be expert in that community, and uh, she or he will be the one who will make a, a lot of decision making for that community. So we have uh, six of those each expert in each community. And, and so uh, we would know uh, if anything about, uh, let's say, Cambodian community, we'll go to him and her for, for, for the assistance and advice. Uh, what do we need? For instance, Cambodian Association of uh, Greater Philadelphia is doing something, and, and I go ask uh, Cambodian, uh, what do we need to do? What do you think are the best? So, then uh, they will say, oh, uh, they are doing this. Uh, so we'll send our troops uh, there. Uh, we'll, send, we'll buy the one table and, and then we'll send our troops. So, so that's how we decide to support each community. And then uh, we'll, uh, we'll do uh, whatever they need to do for them. A different kind of troops. Uh, we had asked a question about um, about the um, about whether, given the the prominence of discussions of race today, whether um, racial disparities will also dictate how people are uh, are cared for uh, going forward. And a vast majority of people responding on to, to that poll felt that that the um, that the issue of race uh, very often determines care and that people of color um, are receiving worse care than their white counterparts. And you're actually uh, trying, while you serve all sorts of people, uh, mm -hmm. you're trying to actually equalize this and bring a consciousness to that disparity and try to heal that. We moved from Jenkins Town, actually Montgomery County, uh, six years ago, and and then after we moved in, we are picking up many uh, non-Asian clients. Now we have uh, close to twenty non-Asian clients, which are mostly uh, African American and Caucasians and few other uh, races. So uh, it's very natural. Uh, as soon as we moved in. We have uh, invited uh, one, uh, actually, person very important to the community, the, uh, the 
the president of Oak Lane Community Action Organization. So he became our uh, board member. And, and we also want to hear from them. We wanted to support the library, their garden club. So we always participate in one of those and, and also block parties. So we have been really wanted to be, be a good neighbor. So they know our effort. You know, that's how we build up the trust from the neighbors. And we did it. Ken, before we, we uh, uh, began the show, you were talking about uh, some of your initiatives um, that, that we wanted to cover. Could you talk a little bit about this? And by the way, um, our current poll is about uh, whether uh, people feel that uh, health care costs will increase, decrease, or stay the same. And 100% respondents so far feel that health care costs are going to go up. Uh, and and uh, that's no surprise. Um, so, Ken, how are you responding to these various needs of your community? And talk about some of your new initiatives as well, please. Sure. Uh, and I would say that I would have to agree with that poll with the, uh, with the majority there or the uh, unanimity there. Um, we are increasing in the healthcare costs. So as we kind of talk a little bit about some of the uh, new program initiatives, I think it's all in line with trying to manage those costs while providing even more valuable services to our seniors. Our most recent program is called Passy Kitchen Express. And it really uh, started in response to the stay at home orders that were necessitated by this pandemic. Now, of course, stay at home orders were tough for, for all of us to deal with. But if you can imagine for some of our, our, our elders and particularly our elders who aren't not well versed in the US culture and, and certainly the English language, it might be even more difficult, especially those who had been relying on coming out to Passy for adult daycare or coming out to our, our beautiful new senior center, not to be able to come out for those programs was a very difficult time. Uh, and, and practically speaking, it was really difficult because for many of our elders, they had been relying on our adult daycare for their main meal each day, uh, which was provided in a congregate setting pre-pandemic. So uh, although you know, those seniors could no longer come to PASI because of coronavirus, what Im just started uh, was PKX, PASI Kitchen Express. If they can't come to us to share a, a delicious, freshly prepared Asian meal, we'll get the meal to them. And we started a program uh, that provides a, again, freshly prepared bento box lunch that's delivered uh, in partnership with some of great organizations that we've been working with, like Mercy Fleet, to get it out to our clients, our adult day center uh, clients who had been displaced by coronavirus pandemic. And what that also gave us an opportunity to do, just to piggyback off of what Imjo was saying about really becoming a member of our community, not just, not just a business resident of our Oak Lane neighborhood, but being a uh, contributing member, we've been able to open our doors even more during the coronavirus pandemic by offering our PKX meals to any older adult who likes Asian meals. So it's not just for, it's not just for uh, Korean Americans like myself, it's for anyone who is adventurous in, in palate and would like to receive a meal and needs that meal uh, because they're also sheltering in place and uh, want to stay at home to, to stay safe, uh, but also remain socially engaged even when our, our delivery people go out and deliver that meal. So we're really proud to have started that initiative and it's really all thanks to, to Imja who uh, really said, we're going to start this program whether or not we have funding. And if it's a good program, funding will find its way to the program. And that truly has been turned out to be the case. And you're acting as ambassadors, right? You're acting as cultural ambassadors. You're including everyone in the joy of, of cooking across different cultural traditions and, and experiencing that from a social distance. What a wonderful, wonderful idea. Imja, let's give you the last word. What do you think the future is for the organization and for these types of organizations across the country? I think we will continue to do well because we try to meet the needs of the community. You know, uh, we wanted to uh, do the equal as a, uh, equality, do, do everything the same treatment, and uh, justice for all. You know, everybody can uh, have uh, opportunity. So uh, that that's the basic. But in uh, during the process, we wanted to do some uh, helping those who need our assistance. 
So um, we'll do well uh, as long as we we are doing going to the right direction. And this is a, this is again, it's a uniquely American story from uh, from people who come here as refugees or as immigrants uh, to uh, people who acculturate and then people who are born here. This is the story of of my grandparents, my great grandparents, my my um, my parents and my children, uh, my wife's. Uh, it's the story that we all share. And then out of those stories, we create services, we create a stronger civil society. Thank you both for sharing your experience. That's the nonprofit report. Attendees, thank you so much for your questions and for participating in the polls. And we'll see you uh, next Tuesday where we'll have another discussion on American civil society. Take care all and stay safe.